From the Skyterra Wellness Retreat, this is the Inspired Intentions Podcast, where we help people build the skills and mindset to live a healthy life. Inspired Intentions listeners, welcome back again today. Alan here, and we have another topic lined up for you, all from a new Inspired Intentions guest. We are going to talk today all about this idea of intuitive eating. What is it, why it's important, and how it could be beneficial to you. And I have none other than our first timer, Morgan Gentris, here on the podcast. Morgan, thanks for coming on. Welcome here today. <laughs> We're super stoked to have you. Uh, Morgan is Skyterra's registered dietitian and intuitive eating expert. And we're going right into it. Um, Morgan, I'd love for you to tell the listeners a, a, a little bit about yourself. Where, where are you from? Yeah, I'm originally from Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, just arrived here in Western North Carolina about eight weeks ago now from Salt Lake City. So quite a big move across the country, but so wow. far it's been absolutely fantastic. We're super happy to be here. Awesome. And you found Skyterra, you were living out West? Total random chance. Like I saw it pop up, I think on Indeed originally, and I showed my husband the job posting and he was like, is it like, it's too good to be true. Um, and so I looked it up and I basically just like messaged and was like, can I talk to someone about this? Like, it just felt like the job description was written for me. And wow. I had a conversation with Teresa and then it just sort of took off from there. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, we're so happy to have you. And I can speak for the guests right now because I talk to them all the time. <laughs> They've loved having you, and Good. you've already been influential in all of our guests' lives here. I it's, love that. It's pretty special. Yeah. So, um, Morgan, you, we were talking kind of before we hopped on mic here about um, some of your background around how you became a dietitian. I thought it was super interesting, uh, your story. Would you mind sharing a little bit of that with the listeners? Yeah. So, I my story, you know, my map, my road to being a dietitian has a couple, I think, really influential uh, pieces to it. So I struggled with a really severe eating disorder for a lot of years of my life. I think, you know, I can comfortably say it started when I was 10 or 11. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I think anyone who's ever struggled with an eating disorder has a hard time saying like, you know, this is my recovery date and time. Um, so that has been a huge influence on my interest in spending my life talking to people about their own disordered eating. Um, but when my dad was pretty young, he was, you know, around 40 something, he had uh, a major open heart surgery. Mm. And at that point in time, I was, you know, really in the thick of my own disordered eating. But that really offered me a perspective to kind of stop and think about how deeply influential food can be on mm -hmm. our health. Um, and I think those two things sort of weave together to create the passion that I have today for helping people change their lives, whether it's from chronic conditions like cardiovascular disease, or if you know they're in the thick of their eating disorder, I think I can just bring such a deep level of empathy and understanding. And for me, I know like I always knew when somebody understood what I had walked through or what I had been through, mm. and it made such a difference for me. And I hope to be that that to someone else. That's it's a great story. Yeah. Um, just another like fun element to that. Uh, I had the opportunity to kind of go back and, and intern under the dietitian that I had worked with uh, when I was oh. in treatment for my own eating disorder. And it was probably, you know, I have no other words except completely full circle and really allowed me to see what it was like to be on the other side and has just that what I felt in that moment when I got to go back there it has stuck with me. And I get to share in that, you know, same experience with some of the patients that I've worked with. And it's just such a, a deep, uh, I don't even know, like special opportunity that I think mm -hmm. drives the passion that I have as a dietitian. What was it like seeing that person again for the first time? Yeah. She opened the office door. I will never forget this. Such a <laughs> crystal clear moment in my brain. And she just looked at me jaw open and was like, I cannot believe you are sitting in my office because the last time we had seen each other, like, you know, I was in inpatient eating disorder treatment. I was very, you know, unwell. And I just said, I, I'm so glad I don't hate you. Like I thought I hated <laughs> you. 
Um, and it, you know, it was just, it was just so great, um, to get to like actually truly comprehend uh, being on the other side of it, the amazing work she's doing for people, because I couldn't appreciate that at the time. Yeah. I think that gives you a really, uh, really great perspective and, uh, probably one of the reasons that you're so successful today. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think what we should start with, um, before we kind of dive into this this whole introduction of the topic is what is intuitive eating? Could you like just define that for us? Yes. So I'd like to first start by saying intuitive eating is not a diet, but the diet industry has tried to coin this term and turn mm. it into something to promote weight loss. Um, intuitive eating is the innate ability to trust that your body is going to guide you on how to nourish it appropriately. And Intuitive Eating is a book that was written by two registered dietitians. It was, you know, written back in the 90s. And okay. these two dietitians basically said, <clears throat> diet culture is ruining people's lives. And we know that we all have this innate ability to sense hunger, sense fullness, and find joy and satisfaction in food. And so the Intuitive Eating framework is 10 principles that lay out the groundwork about how to do just that how to get back to your own ability to know how to nourish your body. And do you know what those 10 principles are? Yes. So principle one is reject the diet mentality, which really goes into detail about, you know, rejecting this idea of diet culture and, mm -hmm. and recognizing all of the ways that it's flawed and all of the ways that it shows up for us. Um, principle two is honor your hunger. Principle three is make peace with food, which is probably my favorite chapter in the whole book. Um, principle four is challenge the food police, which the food police, probably my <laughs> second favorite chapter. Yeah. So, right. We have these external factors, diet culture, social media, mm. food marketing, right? Uh, okay. And this is like the food police that comes in and tells us what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what to do with the body, how to fuel the body, how to feed mm -hmm. it. Right. All of this is like policing, what we physically put into our mouths and fuel our body with. And oftentimes, like, the food police is not factual, right? It's not from this anthropological view that just tells us facts mm -hmm. about food. Um, five, chapter five, is discover the satisfaction factor. So really getting back to how do we find satisfaction and pleasure in the food that we're eating? Because it's really important that we're able to do that. And then chapter six is feel your fullness. So learning all about how to find comfortable satiety when we're eating. Okay. Uh, seven, cope with your emotions without using food. Huge one. Something that I talk to and spend a lot of time counseling people on, right? How do we break away from this? I use food as my only coping mechanism. Um, principle eight, respect your body, which looks different for a lot of people, but mm -hmm. I think there's so many good solid nuggets of information throughout that chapter nine is movement to feel the difference talks a lot about how can we move our body in joyful ways instead of as punishment or just uh, for this one yeah you know i want to lose belly fat so i'm going to do this thing um and then principle 10 is honor your health through gentle nutrition so that really looks at how can we marry all these things together in a gentle way mm -hmm. and not be so rigid and black and white with you know, everything has to be exact with food because it just doesn't. And gentle nutrition is a practice, not a perfect. Gotcha. Would you say that there are folks out here in the world that are intuitive eaters that have just never heard of this before? Totally. Yeah. Totally. If we think about like newborn infants, right? A baby cries when they're hungry and the baby, when they have had enough to eat, will like turn its head away or it will stick its tongue out, right? It gives us these physiological cues like gotcha. I'm done with food toddlers right inherently know I eat when I'm hungry and when they don't want any more food they become very disinterested so they have this you know inherent knowledge like this is when I'm hungry and mm. this is when I'm full but then because of like parental influence or influence from marketing tv social media all these avenues in the world we interrupt that signaling and it's not always from a negative place, but all these influences interrupt that signaling. And we continue to grow up through teenagehood and adulthood, and we are completely unable to recognize these natural hunger, fullness, satisfaction 
signals, but for some people, like they've held on to that and they are naturally just intuitive eaters and they're like, this is what I've just done my whole life. What do you mean? You have to teach people about this. Yeah. But for so many people, like we are just so rooted and steeped in diet culture. They're like, I have I haven't felt true hunger in, you know, twenty plus years. I have no idea what that feels like. And you would consider yourself an intuitive eater now, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's it's so freeing to have you know, food not living rent free in my brain, <laughs> which yeah. is like, you know, of course I'm a dietitian. I talk about food all the time. I sure. teach people about food. I'm counseling people about this. But like when it comes to my own relationship with food, intuitive eating has just been the most freeing thing in the entire world. And that's why you're so passionate about it. Yes. Like it has truly changed my life and has allowed me to spend my time doing things I love instead of you know, fearing food and just spending all of my time and mental energy thinking about how to manipulate food. Gotcha. So you had mentioned, you know, working with and counseling with people. Um, yeah. When you kind of first start to work with like a Skyterra guest or someone, you know, what what is usually their relationship with food like? Mm. Are they aware of this intuitive idea? So I think people are very unaware of this intuitive eating idea. Um, and I don't always come out right and say like, we're talking about intuitive eating. I very okay. delicately weave these principles and ideas throughout my classes or throughout different messaging that I take on with, with the guests. Um, but so often, right, people come here and, you know, they have all these questions about like, what exactly should I eat? How do I feel? my right. body? What do I do? What's enough calories? Um, and Oftentimes my first answer is, I don't know, but we have ways to explore what's the perfect, air quotes, perfect diet for you. Um, but so often people are coming in with this, you know, just really broken relationship with food and, and food lives rent free in their <laughs> brain. And it takes <laughs> up so much mental real estate. Uh -huh. And I think people want, they want the information. They want to know, they understand like, I don't need another fad diet. I know this isn't working, right? It's like the whole throwing spaghetti at the wall, hoping it's going to stick. But like the spaghetti is not even cooked. Of course, it's not going to stick to the wall, right? So like they want the answers. They just don't know what direction to go. And one of my favorite things is giving people permission to just let it go. Mm. Even if they're here for just a week, right? Like giving them permission to be open-minded and explore this other possibility. You know, I'm like, if we can just plant the seed a little bit and mm -hmm. even get someone to try on like one element of intuitive eating, right? In every one of my classes, I talk to people about the hunger fullness scale, Yeah. right? How do we know we're hungry? How do we know we're full? And this alone, I feel like sometimes people are like, uh, I don't know. And like, that's it. We don't know when we're hungry because we let external influences determine when we eat, right? But why are we eating if we're not hungry? Well, because we've turned it off. We don't know how to recognize if we're hungry. So like walking people through how to like explore the mind-body connection through food is one of like my favorite things that I get to do. Backing up real quick, I love your analogy, the spaghetti analogy. Yeah. That's that's hilarious yeah. um, and, and very vivid. Um, <laughs> yeah. But number two, uh, explain the hunger and fullness scale right quick. Yes. So in intuitive eating, right, we have this hunger fullness scale, and it goes from one to ten. And in the middle, we basically have neutral, right? So from one to five, this goes through different levels of hunger that we can experience. Mm -hmm. And then from five up to ten, it explains different levels of fullness that the body might be physically experiencing. And so oftentimes you'll see the scale depicted in like red, yellow, green, mm -hmm. and then yellow, orangish, red on the fullness side. Gotcha. So there's some color associations to kind of cue the brain into like red is like kind of dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. And the red sides of the scale are that one, two level. So the one, two on the, f the hunger side of the scale would be like ravenous, right? Uncomfortably hungry, starting to get these bodily sensations that are not always super pleasant. And then the red numbers on the fullness side of the scale would be 9, 10, which is like uncomfortable fullness, mm. right? Where like you need to lay down, like you might have trouble breathing, like your belly doesn't feel good, you are physically stuffed. And I don't always love this like red color scheme that goes along with it because like 
sometimes we let our hunger and fullness get to those levels both. Mm -hmm. But it's a good signal of like, we don't want to hang out in those areas all the time. Then we move inward on the scale, right? So we get like levels three, four hunger, which is, you know, level three is kind of like, I am aware that I am hungry. I need to eat. Mm -hmm. Level four is more like, I'm noticing some sensation of hunger, but I'm not so hungry that I couldn't go maybe an hour without having a meal. Mm -hmm. And then much like on the other side of fullness, right, we get this seven, eight, right? And so eight would be like, I'm physically full, but I'm not stuffed. Mm. Level seven is sort of this comfortable satiety where you recognize you're no longer hungry, but you're also not feeling like the belly is so full that you couldn't you know take another bite um and then we move inward again right and so we have five which is kind of in the middle and Neutral. then we have six um on the fullness side which you know the perfect world would be hanging out somewhere in this like four ish right three four over to that seven eight mm. range on fullness yeah and what this does is allows us to recognize i'm hungry i should eat and likewise, we can get to that kind of reciprocal side on the fullness scale where you're comfortable, you're no longer hungry, but it oftentimes just kind of feels neutral where yeah. you could eat again in probably, you know, four to five hours. Um, and this really gives us the best chance of protecting against that drastically under eating in restriction and then that drastic overeating where we're overly stuffed. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm feeling like a, like a four and a half right now. Does yeah. that count? Yeah. You can give yourself half points. Sure. Sweet. Yeah. There are no rules here. <laughs> I think it's really good for the analytical person. Yeah. Um, and then the adding the color is really good for the visual person. Totally. Yeah. And like what I really love about this scale is like it takes time to explore. Like it's not something you do one time and you're like, oh, yeah, I've got this. Sure. Right. And like sometimes I explain this to people this way a lot. Right. Sometimes, especially when we're exploring fullness, like we we don't get it right. It takes a lot of practice to figure out, like, what does comfortable satiety look and feel like in my own body? And we have a, a interesting note in here, just kind of keeping on with that. What about what have you seen around guests um, throughout the pandemic? Has, mm. Was that interesting? Yes. So a lot of people easily recognize Throughout the pandemic, I started using food to cope with everything, mm. right? It became a crutch. It became the thing I did because I was home more. I was really stressed out, and so I ate, right? I snacked. I started, you know, whatever it is. It, it was like food became the only tool in the toolbox. And mm -hmm. I will often, again, use this analogy. Love analogies. <laughs> um you know, I say to people, imagine that you are a construction worker, right? And you show up to your job site and you see that you have a, a foundation and you have wood and you have shingles and you have siding. You have all the pieces of the house that you need to put together. And then you go into the back of your work truck and the only tool that you've brought with you is a screwdriver. What happens on the job site? How successful are you in building your house? And people usually look at me and they're like, well, not super successful. Mm -hmm. And then I will say, now imagine that all the pieces of the house are life, right? Emotional stress, physical stress, work stress, kids stress, emotions, busyness, right? We have all these elements of life. And food is the screwdriver, right? Food's the only tool that we brought to the job site. Mm. Not a fair ask of food, right? And also... We need many tools to be successful in building a house. Yeah. We need many tools to deal with all the elements of life. And so when we let food be the only thing, right, we start to misuse food. And we realize that, like, you know, food doesn't fix our stress. It's just a temporary distraction. And using food to cope with emotions or cope with all these other things, you know, on a routine basis is not you know, very intuitive of the body. It's more of a learned behavior. Um, so I've seen a lot of that, you know, and, and people are able to recognize, like, I know this isn't a health promoting behavior. I just don't know how to now break away from the habit that I've built. And I almost always circle that back to, let's go back to hunger fullness. Let's re-explore what it means for your body right here and right now 
to honor hunger and honor fullness because it might look different than what you're used to. And is that one way that you kind of start working with guests while they're here to improve their relationship with food? Yeah, I feel like the hunger fullness is is kind of one of the most, I think, tangible starting points for people because we have this scale that we can look at. Um, you know, I weave this into my classes, which I think gets people interested. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's tangible. It's something for people to look at and apply and they can start practicing here during meal times, which I think really helps solidify the idea that this can be for everyone. And so you're, uh, when you said weave this into your classes, like you have intuitive eating classes here and. So I actually don't have an actual intuitive eating class, but I do have a class on like unpacking emotional eating, right? Where we talk all about like okay. the anatomy of binge eating episodes and how this is so easily accessible and how common binge and emotional eating is for people in the world. Um, so my hope there is just to make people realize this is, you know, somewhat normalized because of diet culture, like binge and emotional eating becomes normalized in diet culture because of the restrictive nature of dieting. And I want people to know that they're not alone and it's okay. And we have ways that we can work on this and improve our relationship with food mm -hmm. through intuitive eating. My nutrition redefined class talk a lot about different elements of intuitive eating, but I don't call out hey, I'm going to teach you guys about intuitive eating today. Gotcha. So really what I what I like doing is planting the seeds, right? Getting people to be more interested in like, ooh, what is this about? And then I can say like, you know, this was adopted from intuitive eating. And in some of my other classes, I will borrow some uh, exercises from the intuitive eating workbook, which is a workbook that goes along with the intuitive eating book. Um, and in those points, like I will highlight like, hey, I borrowed this from the intuitive eating workbook. If you're interested, right, you can uh, do the yeah. whole workbook if you want. Yeah. Um, so I think it's fun to call it out when it's more appropriate, but also just gently weave in these ideas. It, it can kind of be spread across all of the um, classes and education that you do is what yeah. you're getting at. Yeah, because to me, like it's a way of life. It's not just a thing you do for a couple weeks, ah. right? It's, it's the foundation of building a, you know, neutral, positive relationship with food. It's not a fad. No, I hope not. <laughs> no, <laughs> doesn't sound like it. And like here, right? Skyterra is all about, we teach people foundations of how to live a healthy life. And sure. to me, like intuitive eating is the essence of building healthy habits with food that address like whole person wellness, not just here's tips and tricks to like eat well while you're here. Right. Lasting change yeah. versus, you know, temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about the feeling of like the satisfaction factor? Yeah. People are afraid to enjoy food. They're terrified to enjoy food. And I have a slide in one of my lectures that I just say to people, like, tell me what food you eat that you actually hate, but you keep eating it because oh. you think it's health promoting or you eat it because you saw it on social media. Right. And like an influencer told you to eat this for your health. And so many times I'll have people say, like, I hate mushrooms, but I think they're good for me. Or like, I hate <laughs> kale. And I'm like. Yeah, you know, those things taste like dirt. They really do. And it's okay if you hate them. Like, I would rather you eat one vegetable that you enjoy thoroughly than try to eat 45 vegetables that you actually hate. Because there is this mind-body connection that happens when we find satisfaction in food and we enjoy what we're eating and we are also eating foods that are satiating to the body. I'm trying to think of what mine would be. Oh, Halo Top ice cream is another one. People are like, what is that? So Halo Top is like this diet ice cream. Um, it's made with a ton of sugar alcohols, which usually makes people have to go to the bathroom a lot. Hmm. But what often happens is people are afraid of regular full fat ice cream. And so they will opt for Halo Top because it is the perceived healthier option, but really healthier in this setting translates to low calorie, low fat, low sugar, right? And so 
people have said to me, like, I will eat a whole pint of Halo Top in lieu of buying regular ice cream. And I will respond by asking, like, how satisfied did you feel by having a whole pint of Halo Top? And more often than not, the answer is I didn't feel satisfied. Mm. And so this is where intuitive eating really, I think, becomes applicable because there is this notion in intuitive eating that, you know, we can have permission, unconditional permission to eat foods and recognize that we don't have good and bad foods, right? We have foods that contain more or less nutrients. But when we put Halo Top and a pedestal and ice cream down here in the land of I could never have that because I'm a horrible person if I eat it, right? Halo Top suddenly gets this like moral stamp, this like moral stamp of approval. Mm. But what we're missing out on is the satisfaction of eating the food that we truly want. And we're not morally less of a person because we eat full fat ice cream, right? But you might find that you're far more satisfied and need a smaller amount of the full fat ice cream to get to that, you know, satisfaction point. We shouldn't restrict ourselves from things we enjoy. That's one thing I'm hearing from you. Yeah. And like, you know, we can fit all foods in a well-balanced, healthy diet. We truly can. There's, you know, unless you have an allergy or you have some sort of, you know, very bad intolerance to a food. Like I'm never going to tell someone they can't eat a food. Sounds like you're doing a lot of myth busting with people. Oh, all the time. Yeah. I love it. I love when someone asks me something that like they read on social media because my social media probably looks a lot different than other people just because of the information I'm seeking and algorithms and whatever. Sure. But sometimes I am just so floored by something somebody read on social media about food and nutrition and it it makes my job difficult you know sometimes because i'm like i promise you that is not true (laughs) holistic wellness right holistic meaning mind body feeling good feeling good in your clothes eating nourishing foods having energy to work out being able to get up out of bed every day all these things that encompass wellness those things are all impacted by adequately nourishing the body for sure it's amazing. That's like when people are able to say to me, like, I am allowing myself to nourish my body. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's it. Like it is my own aha moment every time that somebody gets to mm. say those things to me. That's kind of, I guess, what you're one of the big changes that you see in folks through working with them. Yeah. Like permission to achieve whole person wellness through food permission to get control back over food permission to have unconditional permission Mm. to eat and know that there are so many other cool things that you can spend your time and energy on in life and food doesn't have to be the only thing what other stuff are you hearing from folks uh like working with a guest and you know they're getting close to leaving like a That's a great, great example, great story, but you've got to hear other stuff too, right? I hear a lot of fear Mm. that people are going to go home and they don't have the skills, right? And so I, all the time, I'm reminding people that, you know, this is a, this is a marathon, right? We're talking about changing habits for life. Things don't change overnight. True. And, you know, small incremental goals are the way that we build sustainable habits and so like you don't have to go home and you know build a whole new house right like we Mm. have to lay the foundation and have patience and keep practicing right it's like learning a new language most people you can study a language and you can practice it and you can learn it but like until you're immersed in the culture where the language is spoken you don't become fluent in the language a lot of times and so I feel like here we kind of do the opposite where we fully immerse people in the language (laughs) and then they have to go home and like do the reverse where they practice and learn. Um, But like, I just, I want people to, you know, know that they can trust their own innate ability to nourish their bodies, but it does take time and practice. Hmm. So for all our listeners out there, what suggestions do you have for them to, you know, maybe experiment with some intuitive eating principles? Like where would you where would you start for somebody that's listening right now? Yeah. 
I think step one is to get really curious, right? Just take a minute and pause and ask yourself, like, how do I know I'm hungry? Hmm. Do I know when I'm hungry? Do I eat food when I'm hungry or do I have this learned behavior of ignoring my hunger? And if we can pause and ask ourselves that, right, we're opening that channel of communication once again. Like, look up the hunger fullness scale, right? Take a look at it. See if you can identify, you know, when do I decide to eat? And if you don't know, maybe pick a number and try to get to that level, right? And, and just, again, like, open the door for communication because if we don't listen, we can't receive the message, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's kind of a, a tangible, practical way to start looking at intuitive eating. Um, there's a really fun exercise in the workbook <laughs> that I think is it's kind of easy to practice, but uh, it's this idea of, like, trying to eat with our non-dominant hand which probably sounds kind of funny, but (laughs) imagine, right? Like it does think about when you go to eat, right? You don't think about it. You don't, you sit down and you pick up a fork or a spoon or whatever it is. And you just start the act of eating because it's such an automatic process. We learned how to do this many, many years ago, most of us. Right. And so the whole idea of eating with your non-dominant hand is to, you know, sit on your dominant hand so you don't feel obligated to use it and try to eat a meal with your non-dominant hand and just notice how much mental energy goes into the process of eating, (laughs) right? If you're eating soup, get a bib because you're going to make a mess (laughs) unless you are skilled at eating with both hands. Um, And the whole purpose of this exercise is to bring hyper awareness Mm -hmm. to how much we have to slow down when eating is not automatic. Right. And so for most of us, we eat in text, we eat and read emails, we eat and do something else. We watch TV. We're on a work meeting. Right. We don't just sit and eat. We're distracted. We're distracted and distracted eaters. Almost always. This has been studied. There's so many studies in the intuitive eating book that point at distracted eaters take much longer to get to the level of satisfaction because the mind is distracted. We're not listening to the body. And so eating with that Hmm. non-dominant hand really brings awareness to you have to slow down. You have to focus on the task of eating. Mm -hmm. And of course, like, you know, you do this once and you're like, oh, haha, okay, I get it. But then take that, take that slowness, take that awareness and try to apply it to the next time you eat. Right. And these little moments of bringing more awareness, slowing down, being more conscious of like, okay, I don't have to rush through eating. This isn't a race. Right. That's what gets us to knowing the body of satisfaction, exploring and feeling what it feels like to become more comfortably full. That's a really interesting way of testing that out. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Any uh, anything else uh, experiments that you might suggest for folks to maybe work with this idea of intuitive eating? Yeah. So set a timer. Right. Mm. And maybe you typically spend five minutes eating. So setting a timer for 30 minutes is probably not practical. Right. But, you know, set a timer for a meal. This could be one meal. You don't have to do three meals a day. Right. And take the full. I'm going to use 20 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Take the full 20 minutes to eat your meal. And just see what it what different experience. Right. This is all about exploration. There's no right or wrong. There's no like, you have to do this, you don't have to do this. But just take the time to chew your food. (laughs) Take one bite at a time and just allow yourself the experience of treating your meal like a fine wine tasting, right? Imagine, or some other, if you don't drink, like something else where you are savoring, right? And when we treat our food like a fine wine tasting, we pause and we try to notice flavor notes, right? We're not chugging mm-hmm. wine. We're at a wine tasting, I hope. Um, your intention changes when you're tasting really nice wine. Treat your food like that. Give it time to tell you like what flavors are here, what smells are here, what is the texture of your food like, what is the temperature of the food like, what bodily sensations do you notice when you're eating a cold, crunchy salad instead of a piping hot bowl of soup? And that is a way that we can really like open up 
exploring all of the senses with eating, but maybe like, you know, you start with 10 minutes because that's all you have, but 10 minutes is better than two minutes while you're shoveling food in your mouth and answering emails. Yeah. All those little distractions that we have. Yeah. I kind of imagine um, like you go to somebody's house and they cook you dinner and when yeah. you're, you like enjoy it, you're like, mm-hmm. what is in this? And you like slow down with that yeah. next bite. You're mm-hmm. like, is that tarragon? Like right? what? Yeah. Yeah. And like I have a, you know, like mindful eating experience class and it's always so fun when people like, you know, I'll put something down in front of them and they get this like immediate yuck reaction on their face I can see it and like you don't have to eat it but can we smell it can we hold it in our hands and explore the texture of this food and really like unpack why Mm. we have this immediate visceral like no reaction and sometimes people even like try the food and they're like I never knew I liked this like this is amazing (laughs) yeah you know and I'm like yeah because we quiet the external factors and we just cue into what does the body actually want in this moment yeah and it's a really cool shift to get to notice in people when they just allow the sensations to be explored i think those are some some really good tangible um experiments that people could could work with at home right now the yeah. sitting on your hand trying that non-dominant <laughs> hand yeah slowing down <laughs> taking that 20 minutes and really uh really diving into it that's uh those are powerful um, anything, I mean, that's a ton of information. I can tell how passionate you are about this. Anything else that you think folks should know around intuitive eating? Um, you could like actually put a block on your outlook calendar. So you have time to eat lunch during your oh, work day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have one in mind. That's um, for sure. Cause we just don't right. We, like our society does not encourage people to Great stop tip. to take meal breaks, yeah. but you need to nourish your body if you yeah. want your brain to work efficiently. So hundred percent. Um, yeah, of course. Like if people really want to dive into this, the intuitive eating book, um, is really like, the, the framework in and of itself, the workbook that goes along with it has more, you know, exercises to practice that coincide with each chapter, each principle of that book. Um, so that's a great tool and resource. Is it just called the intuitive eating book? Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's available like anywhere you can listen to it. Pretty much Amazon everywhere yep. you can imagine. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for hopping on here yeah. and talking about it. I mean, I, we've, been through a ton of information and there's i feel like this podcast there's just so many good tidbits in there across the board that you've you've given folks i I hope that everyone that's listening finds this as fun and useful as i did me too so let's brainstorm together some stuff that we can talk about next i loved having you on here and we'll get you back on here soon for sure listeners if you all have questions for morgan send us an email inspired intentions at skyterrawellness.com yeah i'm happy to get questions over uh to you morgan and maybe we'll have morgan back on to answer them on the podcast cool thanks sweet all right thanks everyone the inspired intentions podcast is a production of skyterra wellness retreat Special thanks to our executive producer, Alan Broyhill. Send us your questions and comments to inspiredintentions at skyterrawellness.com. Subscribe on iTunes and everywhere podcasts can be found. If someone you know might benefit from this podcast, share Inspired Intentions with them and give us a five-star rating. Join us next week as we cut through the unrealistic noise on diets and fitness and show you how healthy living fits seamlessly into your already busy life. Thanks for listening.